You ever get a phone call from somebody and they ask if you're busy or if you're available? How many of you are, are ever tempted to say, well, it depends. <laughs> well, if you just want to talk for a few minutes, I'm available. If you want me to go to China, well, I'm kind of busy right now. <laughs> or if you want me to do something for you, I'm really busy right now. You know, our availability is often contingent on our willingness to be available for whatever God has us to do. I think we can all relate to that. You know, you're watching your favorite show and somebody calls and says, you have a few minutes to talk in your heart. You want to say, no, I'm watching my favorite show. But sometimes God calls us to be available. Well, God is calling Moses to be available in Exodus chapter 3 and chapter 4. And he's been asking some questions about God before he goes. The first question I thought was quite reasonable. Exodus chapter 3, verse 13. Verse 11, Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? I mean, I have been away for 40 years. I'm a stranger. I'm not considered part of the palace group anymore. And then God assures him by saying, I will be with you in verse 12. And that should have ended all discussion. Just knowing that God is with you should give you the courage and the determination to do whatever God is calling you to do. But Moses continues the questions. Verse 13, suppose I do go to them and they ask me what your name is. What shall I tell them? Well, God patiently answered that question. And he says, God will make the Egyptians favorably disposed toward you. And they will give you what you want as you're leaving the country. And so you will plunder the Egyptians. Chapter 4, Moses answered, what if they don't believe me or listen to me? and say, the Lord did not appear to you. So he's coming up with all of these negative possibilities. Verse 2, then the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground, and it became a snake, and he ran from it. Then the Lord said, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake, and it turned back into a staff in his hand. Verse 5, this, said the Lord, is so they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has appeared to you. Now, there's a couple significant things about this. Number one, the serpent was a symbol of Pharaoh himself. It was a symbol of the power and authority and sovereignty of Pharaoh. He even wore the symbol of the serpent and the snake on his headdress. And so by Moses throwing his staff down and it becoming a serpent, serpent and picking it up and turning back to a staff, that's showing right away that God has power over Pharaoh, that God has power over the enemy, over the opposition. It's a very powerful introductory miracle. And by seeing that, the people will say, oh, this is the God that not only is the God of our ancestors, but he is God over Pharaoh. He's power, more powerful than the snake himself. Verse 6, then the Lord said, put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses puts his hand into his cloak and he pulls it out and it's leprous as white as snow. Now put it back in your cloak. So he puts it back in his cloak and he pulls it out and it's clean. And the Lord said, if they don't believe the first sign, they might, they might believe the second sign. Here's the thing. The first sign symbolizes God's power. The second sign symbolizes God's purity, being able to make the impure pure. We need both aspects of God in our lives. We need the power of God and we need the purity of God to make us more like God, to make us more like Christ. You know, another thing I noticed about this story is that God likes to use what is in Moses' hand. And if you read throughout the Bible, God doesn't expect people to be stupendously gifted and powerful amongst all other people. He simply uses the resources that we have available to us. Book of Judges, Shamgar took an ox goad and he knocked off a whole bunch of enemies with that ox goad in his hand. And then what about Samson? He took a donkey's jawbone and killed a thousand men with the donkey's jawbone. What about Jesus? He took five loaves and two fish from a little, a little boy's happy meal and fed 5,000 people with it. What about David? He took a little slingshot with one stone and he knocked Goliath out in the first round. 
The Lord loves to use what we have in our hands. God is less concerned about ability and more concerned about our availability. That's what God wants. And one of the reasons why God's going to get mad at Moses at the end of this chapter is because Moses denies his availability and says, God, send somebody else. The one thing God does not want is your unwillingness to be available. Well, Exodus chapter 4, verse 9, God said to Moses, if they do not believe these first two signs, the power sign, the purity sign, and if they don't listen to you, take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. The water you take from the river will become blood on the ground. Now, the Nile River was the source of prosperity for the Egyptian people. That's where they got their water. That's where they got water for their homes, for their crops. And so God says, if they will not accept my sovereignty over Pharaoh, then they'll have to respond to my authority over the economy, over the water. And it also prefigures what's going to happen with the plagues, that there's going to be a plague of blood. On the, there's going to be the staff turned into the snake and the plague of blood. Verse 10, Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I've never been eloquent. Now the, the excuses are starting to come out. You got the wrong guy, Lord. Yeah, I know that you'll be with me. Yes, I know that you'll use whatever is in my hand. But, you know, this is about being a good speaker. And I've never been known as being an eloquent speaker. You know what? I think it took a lot of eloquence just to say that to Almighty God to his face. So I'm thinking that Moses isn't being completely truthful here. But then he says, Lord, I've never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. Well, you're eloquent right now, dude. I am slow of speech and tongue. And then, verse 11, the Lord's been patient. The Lord said to him, who gave man his mouth? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak, and I will teach you what to say. Verse 12, this isn't trying to say that God takes delight in making people mute or deaf or anything like that. It's simply saying that God can work through anybody, regardless of their ability or lack of ability. I'm the one who gives. I'm the one who works through them. I, I think that's all that that's saying. Verse 12, I will help you. So before God said, I will be with you in chapter 3, and now he's going a step further. I'm not just going to be with you. I'm going to help you. Man, what, what more assurance do you want? And then verse 13, Moses says, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. Well, that changes that whole song from Isaiah chapter 6. Here am I, Lord, send someone else. <laughs> Instead of here am I, Lord, send me. And then verse 14, the Lord's anger burned against Moses. I told you he doesn't like it when he calls us and we make ourselves unavailable for him. And then God says, what about your brother Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak well. He's already on his way to meet you, and he'll, he will be glad to see you. Now, at first, that sounds like an accommodation. God's mad at Moses, but he's such a gracious and kind God that he's going to give Aaron to help him out and give Moses extra assurance. But as you read the Exodus story further into the book, you find out that Aaron is more of a bother than a blessing because Aaron is going to lead the Israelites into idolatry and build that golden calf in Exodus 32. His own sons are going to offer sacrifices that are unauthorized in Leviticus 10, and they're going to be killed. And Aaron and his wife are going to rebel against Moses in Numbers chapter 12. So throughout the narrative, Aaron turns out to be more of a hindrance than a help. And so it's when you look at the big picture, is Aaron an accommodation to Moses' insecurities or is Aaron a punishment? <laughs> you know, it's worth asking the question because you look at it and Aaron was not the help that Moses would have wanted throughout the years in many occasions. 
So, verse 15, the Lord said to Moses, you shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak. So I'm going to help him too. And I will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you, and it will be as if you're, he were your mouth and as if you were God to him. But take this staff in your hands. You can perform the signs with it. So, you know, this is not like this holy guy who says, oh, I love you, Lord. I'll do whatever you tell me to do. You know, Moses is fighting God, kicking and screaming along the way. Verse 18, then Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said, let me return to my own people in Egypt to see if any of them are still alive. You know, he's not saying God appeared to me and said, go and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. He's just saying, let me go back and visit. Jethro said, go, and I wish you well. You know, after 40 years, you know, he should at least let him go for a couple of days. <laughs> Verse 19, now the Lord had said to Moses and Midian, go back to Egypt for all those who wanted to kill you are dead. So Moses took his wife and sons, put them on a donkey and started back to Egypt. Then he took the staff of God in his hand. Verse 21, the Lord said, when you return to Egypt, perform before Pharaoh all these wonders I've given you the power to do, but I will harden his heart so that he, that he will not let the people go. You say, well, that's not fair. You, why is God hardening Pharaoh's heart? Well, you got to understand, it's not like Pharaoh is an unwilling partner. It's not like Pharaoh is saying, oh, I wish I could love the God of the Israelites. If only God would let me, but God won't let me. He's hardening my heart. It's not like that at all. Pharaoh didn't know the Lord. We're going to find out in Exodus chapter five. He doesn't care about the Lord. He doesn't give two bits about the will of the God of Israel. And so God is giving him what more of what he already has. <laughs> He's saying, all right, have it your way. He's giving him the hard hardening, a heart that is already hard, basically. And so verse 22, then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn son. And I told you, let my son go so that he may worship me. But if you refuse to let him go, I will kill your firstborn son. We actually got three firstborn sons happening in this passage. Israel is God's firstborn son because they're the first ones to have a covenant relationship with him. Pharaoh has a firstborn son. And now we're about to read about Moses' firstborn son. And God is angry with Moses because he hasn't circumcised him. You know, Moses says that he's a follower of the God of Israel, but he's not following the most important rule by making his family part of the covenant. Verse, now we read about it. Verse 24, at a lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. What a strange episode, right? Verse 25, but Zipporah took a flint knife, cut off her son's foreskin, and touched Moses' feet with it. Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me, she said. So the Lord let him alone. At that time, she said bridegroom of blood, referring to circumcision. Well, what in the world is that all about? Well, there's a lot of comments in the commentaries about it. Some people say that God was... The, the most traditional answer is that Moses is supposed to be the leader of the Jewish people, but he refuses to circumcise his son as part of the Jewish community. He's breaking the original sign of the covenant, and God is angry with him because of that. So that that's the most commonly given explanation for this section. But there's a possible reading of the Hebrew text that instead of the Lord about to kill Moses, that the Lord was about to take the child. I don't think so, though. I, I think what we have here is Moses being hypocritical, you know, saying, you know, I consider myself part of the Jewish community, but I'm not all in because I'm not letting my son be circumcised. Maybe Moses' wife thought circumcision was unnecessary and he was capitulating to her rather than obeying the covenant of God. I don't know. At any rate, she circumcised him and God lets it go. And there, oh, there's another interpretation that 
Moses killed that guy in Egypt with his bare hands, and then he had to flee to Midian. And now that he's left Midian to go back to Egypt, he's no longer in a city of refuge. And that's why the Lord is about to kill him. Interesting interpretation. Again, I'm not convinced. Okay, verse 27. The Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he met Moses at the mountain of God and kissed him. Just like God said, Aaron was glad to see him. Then Moses told Aaron everything the Lord said. And then verse 29, Moses and Aaron got together the elders of the Israelites. They performed the signs. They believed. And when they heard the Lord was convinced of, concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshiped. What a great response of God to the elders. It was wonderful that these elders responded to the Lord that way. Just over, you know, a couple of miracles. We've experienced greater miracles than that. We have Jesus dying on the cross for our sins and rising again. We have the empty tomb. We have the word of God. We have many convincing proofs that Jesus Christ is alive, and we're going to be thinking more about them as we get closer and closer to Easter Sunday. Tomorrow night, I'll be preaching in church about the meaning of Holy Communion, and then Good Friday, looking at the cross and resurrection and glorification and exaltation of Jesus Christ, and then, of course, Easter Sunday, the resurrection event itself. But we have so many convincing proofs of God's activity in history as well as in our lives. So I encourage you to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and make yourself available be available for god's work in your life whether it's in church or outside church jesus loves you this i know for the bible tells me so we'll see you guys tomorrow for exodus chapter 5